Today's going to be a special things hidden discussion. Now, when mm-hmm. I started my radio broadcast, I used to, at WFLA Orlando, they used to record these promotions of telling people to tune into my show. And I would say, I am your political exorcist, because I was trying to make a point about the state of politics and current events. But then as I continued in current events, I said, my, I, I don't want to claim that title. This stuff is too messy for me. Uh, and so I, uh, I, I, I kind of shied away from using that language in the course of my radio show as the world events started getting darker and darker. I said, this is too much. But now we have an actual exorcist with this. We have uh, Father Vincent Lampert. He's a Catholic priest, and he's uh, an exorcist in the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Indianapolis. How you doing, sir? I'm doing very well, David. It's good to be with you today. Yeah, it's great to, to have you on. So we've been looking at a lot of the spiritual warfare aspects of life in, in the last uh, several programs. Uh, it is the holy season, Lenten uh, season for many Christians around the world who listen into this program, and many folks who are not religious listen to this program and are interested in some of the insights that we're pulling for current events. So there's a lot of angles we could start from, but I'm going to try a little bit different angle at first. Can a nation be possessed? And the answer is absolutely. Even as a good example, uh, just a few years ago, the the, the Catholic bishops of Mexico actually said an exorcism prayer over the entire country as a way to try to address the reality of the drug cartels and all the evil that's associated with drug abuse. So how does one survive? So, if, if, so how does that work from a collective spirit standpoint? Because if you are trying to live a, a, a Christian life and a holy life, but you're in a possessed nation, you're going to pick up spirits of the collective that are probably going to put diabolical ideas and desires in your head, even if you're doing everything you can to follow God, right? I mean, because you're, you're, you're in that culture, you're saturated in that culture, and even though you might try to, you know, isolate yourself from that culture, you're still thinking within that current because that's what you're a product of in your times, right? Absolutely. You can be exposed to that. Your comment made me think of the line in the Bible where Jesus says to be in the world but not of the world. So we can be in a particular culture, a particular environment. But as Christians, I always believe that if we're living out our faith, if one is going to church and praying and reading the Bible, then the devil is already on the run. So people that are uh, truly living out their faith, I don't believe that they really have anything to fear from the evil one. The evil one may try to afflict them to some degree to see if he can find a crack in their spiritual armor. But again, if one is truly committed to the Lord, no matter what the devil does, he will be ineffective. So when you talk about the evil one afflicting us, how does that actually work? Are there millions of these entities or billions of these spirits? Do we have any count or estimate from the church traditions? <laughs> well, we can only go to the uh, the book of Revelation when it speaks about angelic creatures and other places in the Bible that says that there are thousands and thousands and myriads and myriads, so they can't even be counted. But from the Christian perspective, Lucifer, along with one-third of the angelic choir, fell uh, from heaven. So they were cast out of heaven, but they weren't cast out of creation. God still has a role and purpose for the demons to play. But the good news is, if you do your math, two-thirds is greater than one-third. So there are more good angels than there are fallen angels. So is it, it when you're walking around in life and you're dealing with human sin and human fallenness, is it like an ocean where you're swimming in an ocean and people sometimes watch Jaws and they think there's a shark around every corner? Is that how it is where it's like if you look at the big picture, you're probably not near a shark? And this shark, and so the, like the, the odds of a demon being around you is like a shark swimming by you. You may not, it's not as prevalent as you think, or is it, no, 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 that's not a good metaphor. They're all around you all the time. Like there's enough of them to cover everybody. <laughs> you got how many people? Nine billion people in America. I mean, nine nine billion people on the planet Earth. So, is there enough for everybody to have one harassing them all the time, or are they kind of sw- sw- swimming around the spiritual ocean, so to speak, and 
mess with you and then go on and you're not being bothered by demons for some substantial amount of time. How does that work? I think demons will always try to afflict us. They're around us. But again, I think in the second book of Kings, when Elisha the prophet is with his servant, and it looks like the Israelites are going to be defeated on the battlefield, and Elisha prays and says, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And then the servant was able to see that out on the battlefield, God's angels were fighting with the Israelites and they routed the foe. So yes, demons are around us. They do try to afflict us. But we should always remember that God's good angels outnumber the bad angels, and God is always on our side providing protection. However, when people give in to things of a demonic nature, when people turn away from God, then they can put themselves being more susceptible to the attacks of demons. But again, if we're, you know, as St. Paul says, putting on the, the full armor of Christ, we really have nothing to fear. But when people begin to no longer live out their faith or doubt their faith. Think of the fact that the world in which we live today, faith seems to be in decline. Many people who grew up in Christian families or households now identify as being an atheist. They no longer believe in God. And faith in God will lead us in one direction, and the lack of faith will lead us in another. So I like to say that as an exorcist, I don't believe that the devil has upped his activity today but I do believe that more people are willing to play the devil's game because they've walked away from their faith. So when you when you look at this, uh, the, the the ministry of exorcism, it is a um, it is something that a lot of folks have a lot of sensationalism that they've always attached around it. But at the end of the day, there is a, a real concern for what people believe to be something which is beyond just human evil. And so I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot of Christian traditions that say, look, why are you scapegoating the devil for things that are just as deeply fallen evil between human beings? Human beings are got enough diabolic or, or whatever. I guess that's the word that's a play, but you know, humans have enough deep total depravity as Calvinists would say that you don't need to go around. Blank. Yes. There, you know, there's a lot of Christians that say, Oh yes, there are spirits. Uh, and yes, they are real, but 99% of the time, you don't need to be blaming the devil for something that it's just your own wicked heart that's that's doing, you know? Yeah, we can't always say the devil made me do it, mm -hmm. because we all have free will. You know, the devil can propose, but he cannot impose. Think of the fall of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. You know, the devil tempted. You know, the devil didn't take the forbidden fruit and cram it down Eve's throat. He presented it as something good so that Eve would make that choice for herself. So the devil is always trying to objectify evil as something good so that we will choose it. But yeah, you're right. We should never try to blame the devil for all of our activities. We do have free will. We have personal choice. And we should always make the choice for God. But when we make the choice for evil, the devil will always take advantage of that as a way to advance his kingdom as opposed as Christians, where our goal is to advance the kingdom of God. So there are some people, too, that would say that evil is not personified. The Catholic Church would say that evil is personified in what we call the devil and these other fallen angels, that evil is not just humanity's inhumane treatment of one another. It's not just something of our own making. So, yeah, there is sin based on choices that we make that we are responsible for, but then there are also occasions where the devil will try to trip us up as a way to destroy us. Do you think, I mean, I know this is, I guess, not maybe good to speculate in some traditions, but if, if for in a, in a world where let's say the devil was just bound up the entire time, not able to tempt us, would humanity have been pretty much just as sinful all throughout history, probably just because of our own temptations to, treat each other wrong and be prideful and egotistical and envious? Is it, or is would, it, you know, you know what I'm saying? Would we have, would we have made a, a holy hell mess of everything we've had in our, in our, in our, in our history, if we didn't have that extra push to evil, or do you think that's a big factor in everything that, that we see around us in terms of the sin? I think it's the big factor mm -hmm. because, you know, before the fall, Adam and Eve lived in this perfect state of grace. Mm-hmm. And it was something external. So the the desire to rebel against God was planted in them by the serpent in the garden. 
again, the temptation to turn away from God. And the devil tries to do that all the time to get us to turn away from God and to choose the evil. And again, as I just said, he wants to present the evil as something good. You know, the serpent even says to Eve, did God really tell you not to eat of that fruit? And, you know, he says, you certainly will not die. You will become like gods. But he's a liar because, again, what was the consequence of original sin? Death entered into the world. So prior to all of that, humans lived in perfect harmony with God. And again, I think that's our goal through life is to be able to reject sin, whether it's personal or whether it's something that's coming from the devil, so that one day we can arrive into heaven and be in that perfect state of grace with God for all eternity. And that death anxiety does seem to underpin so much of the wickedness that we engage in around the world, that feeling of there's a finite existence I have, my clock's ticking, it's an unconscious feeling, and that's why I cut people off in traffic, or that's why I, I'm greedy in my business practices, that's why I'm egotistical in relationships, right? It's that there's the unconscious kind of, you know, you know, if you want to use Darwinian terms, a survival of the fittest kind of mindset that's driving us to always have to have this kind of tension of like, well, I've got to get mine before it's, you know, before my time is ended. And I think a lot of Christians live like that. Even, you know, they, they partition the spiritual world with their everyday mundane world, right? They say, well, I'll be a Christian on the, on the days I go to church. Uh, and then when I'm out in the world, I'm a ruthless capitalist and I'm just taking advantage of employees and working them to death. And, and, you know, because it doesn't matter because that's my safe little private sector world. I can do that. And, and that's okay. But ultimately that, like you mentioned, that, that introduction of death drives a lot of the sin that we engage in, doesn't it? It does. You know, if you think about it, God is all about existence. I mean, what's the name of God that we learn from the Bible? I am. So God is existence. And the devil is all about non-existence, death and destruction. And God yeah. is really all about life and community. So the devil would try to, to give us to get us to live in a manner that opposes God. You know, there is extraordinary demonic activity where the devil really is to blame for what's going on. But then there's ordinary demonic activity where the devil just tries to get us to use our free will in such a way that we, re we rebel against God. And when it comes to the ordinary activity of the devil, I would say it begins with deception, which leads to division, which leads to diversion, which leads to discouragement. And that discouragement will either lead to death, either a spiritual death, a complete rejection of God, sometimes a physical death. We think of the growing trend of suicide in our society. But as Christians, we live as people of hope. And the other choice would be discipleship. People renew their commitment to God or they come to God for the very first time. But with deception, the devil wants us to get to get us to buy into his lies, you know, to live as that capitalist, as you were just saying. And then where, where does that lead us? We're broken, we're divided. And when we're broken and divided, it leads to diversion. We look for a substitute that's going to fill the emptiness in our lives. Think of the growing trend of addictive behavior in our society, whether it's the opioid crisis, fentanyl, uh, you know, abuse going throughout society, the scandal pornography that's rampant in society today. And when people arrive in all these forms of diversion, that substitute for God, where does it lead them? It leads them discouraged, a lack of meaning, purpose, and direction in life. Mm -hmm. Really, I think of the ministry of exorcism, it's about helping people reconnect with Christ or to come to Christ for the first time, who ultimately gives human existence, ultimate meaning, purpose, and direction. So would you say that, uh, you know, things like pornography and gambling and now the AI are portals to the demonic? Absolutely. Again, whether you have, you seen the AI where they're talking to people and, and a lot of people say you're opening your channel. And then there, there are these new beautiful AI images that look really realistic. They can make a, picture of aborigines it looks exactly like real people but it's totally ai generated is this is this potentially completely diabolical or is there any redemptive element to this type of technology i wouldn't say that it's inherently evil so anytime okay. people ask me about something my question would be is it inherently evil was it created solely for the purpose of destroying people's lives mm. 
So technology in general is not inherently evil, but it can be used in such a way that it leads people down a dark path away from God and into the world of darkness and the devil. Mm -hmm. So all these things that people take for granted are portals to demonic activity. Does that mean that one is having, uh, inviting demonic spirits to oppress and be in your life if you engage in sins like gambling and addictive behaviors, drugs, pornography? Absolutely, it can. You know, sometimes people directly cultivate relationships with demons, meaning they do things that they know they should not be doing, but they do them anyway. Sometimes people fall into that indirectly. They believe that something is fun or entertaining but they don't understand the gravity of the situation in which they are in. St. Paul in 2 Corinthians writes about the fact that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light, and he deceives many people. And the devil can use uh, addictive behavior to convince people that it's something good, but really just to pull them into a world of darkness. You know, you look at pornography, pornography for example, it degrades the human person and reduces the human person to an object. And the human person is God's greatest creation because the human person is created in the image and likeness of God. So when the human person is attacked or distorted, then the devil believes in an indirect way, he's actually distorting the very image of God himself. It seems as if, you know, by that standard then, that uh, America truly is in a state of deep, collective possession because we have in the West, because look at all the things that they're telling us are moral imperatives. They're telling us to extinguish our young, to kill the babies if needed, which is an attack on the womb, which is something Satan has always hated since the beginning with the fall, right? With this, the seed of the woman and this hatred yeah. for the womb is, is one of Satan's biggest hatreds. You have an attack on the idea of having children in the first place because the planet's going to blow up. You're having this statement of, well, uh, you know, if you do ha you know, have a kid, you need to think about telling them to mutilate their genitalia so they cannot breed, you know, so all or not, not procreate. So all these different things are attack on life, on the continuation of human life. You look at some of these photos of people who regret having their breasts removed or their different uh, parts removed. And it looks like they have an eyes of someone who's been completely demonically oppressed. And yet these are spreading faster than ever before through TikTok. Everybody's imitating things and they're mm -hmm. spreading like wildfire. It's almost like they, because of technology uh, and, uh, and the power of, of kind of tech, the, the, the digital age, the devils don't have to do as much action themselves. They can kind of sit on autopilot and multi multiply their effect, right? No, it's like they plant a seed. And then they sit back and watch how it grows. Yeah. And again, everything that you're talking about, the attacks on the human person, speak of non-existence. Yeah. So killing children in the womb, it's all about death and destruction. So again, God is about life, but the devil is about death. And even, no matter how we wrap it, you know, we can use creative language today, you know, like for abortion, is it reproductive rights? No matter what we call it, the, the end is still the same. It's the destruction of human life. And that would please the devil nothing more than, you know, more than anything is that he's convinced us to kill ourselves. It seems to me that's what, what, what is becoming the new moral imperative is that you embrace, I mean, they're, they're embracing euthanasia. Now they're making ads that are very slick and beautiful in, in Canada and mainstream television to promote extinguishing your life. The Canada just said that minors have a right to assisted suicide. It is mm -hmm. truly insane. It feels like we're living in a madhouse. It's really, you know, it's now become, this stuff was always on the margins. I remember when Malachi Martin wrote the book, Hostages to the Devil, he said there was an uptick in interest in possessions, but they didn't have teenagers being normalized to have assisted suicide back then. We've really mm -hmm. come a long way since even that time when people were getting into these things like uh, occultism and so forth. Yeah, it, again, it's a sad reality. I was talking with a group of um, exorcist priests the other day, and uh, one of them commented that the number one question that people are Googling on the Internet, can you guess what it is? Am I possessed? 
how to make a pact with the devil. Oh, <laughs> how wow. to make a pact yeah. with the devil, because yeah. somehow the devil is now seen as this kind of chic and charismatic figure who can give us what we want. Yeah. But we always have to realize that, that when you play with the devil, eventually the devil expects to be paid. And mm -hmm. how does he want to be paid? It's with our death and destruction. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus came to give us life and so that we might have it more abundantly. But the devil wants nothing more than to snuff out the life of the human person. And again, he can present his deceptions as something good. And even when people turn to the devil, you know, try to sell their soul to the devil, initially, maybe they receive a favorable response. But that's nothing more than a trick to try to lure them even uh, deeper into the world of the lies and deception. Um, yeah, I mean, that's uh, there's always a, a, a kind of price to pay is because because the devil is not offering anything unconditional. It's always with a condition. Right. Absolutely. Um, when you uh, when you see this this type of uh, interest in this, do you think that most of it is just um, faddish pop culture normalization of the you know like you said this kind of chic rebel because everything's about rebellion we're our, our culture is about the spirit of rebellion uh, you know you tell me there's only two genders I don't accept it I'm a rebel you tell me uh, you know kids should have uh, uh, respect for their parents we're going to throw that bound every boundary has to be rebelled against now and that's the new morality what's what's driving this I think it's a misguided notion of freedom. Mm -hmm. you know, I think a lot of people today believe that freedom means you can do whatever you want. I believe that a majority of people today live by three guiding principles. You may do whatever you wish. Nobody has the right to command you, and you are the God of yourself. Mm -hmm. It was St. John Paul II who said that freedom, in the true sense of the word, means to live in the manner that God created us to live. So when we are obedient to God, and we live out according to God's commands, that's freedom in the true sense of the word. When we start believing that freedom means we can do whatever we want, then we end up becoming slaves to our own passions and desires. Again, think for a moment, when were Adam and Eve truly free? Before the fall or after the fall? When they were being obedient to God and not eating of the fruit of the, of the uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil? So mm -hmm. humans are called to live within limitations. But I think evil wants us to live without limitations. You know, even Pope Benedict, when he was the uh, Holy Father of the Catholic Church, would say, just because humans are capable of doing something doesn't mean that it's the moral right thing to do. So just because we can do it doesn't mean that we should do it. We should live within our limitations. But again, because we don't want to live with limitations, the same way with the devil, that's why the devil fell. He didn't want to live with limitations. And the notion is that misery loves company. So the devil really wants us to join him in eternal damnation and separation from God. Does that mean that if someone dies while being possessed, they will go to hell? No, because if one's possessed, it's always of a physical nature. Okay. One soul can never be possessed because that's a very holy and, and, uh, special place reserved to God alone. But again, the question would be if somebody dies, that connection with the demonic ends, but then ultimately that person has to stand before God and to be judged for how they chose to live in this life. In the book, Hostage to the Devil, I've been reading through it. And, you know, he, he talks about five American possessions in contemporary history that he got the audio tapes for. And it's very interesting. I, I felt like he was... Malachi Martin was trying to make a point, an illustration of different types of possessions and how they do it. And one of them, you know, you know, first one starts off, the the, the girl is uh, got a defiant spirit. The, the nun teaching her says, you know, there cannot be both being and non-being. And he says, well, I can't there be, just like you were talking about, trying to break through and, and, and draw towards the absence of being, this non-existence. Mm -hmm. And this woman says that the possession started subtly for years and years that working on her defiant spirit and her intellectual uh, mind, right? You're trying to appeal to her through intellectual ideas. And um, 
kept trying to get this idea of, well, if you have crosses, we can have inverted crosses too. And if if you have light, there can be darkness. Why can't we embrace, you know, it was trying to make space for if you have good, we can have equally valid evil to counter it all. And she kept being accepting, accepting, accepting of this. And she said it felt as if she was being married to non-being itself, which kind of goes to your point. Uh, the spirit was trying to get her to be aware of what was presented to her as special knowledge about the nature of human beings, that there is a flow between human beings that's on the that's underneath the conscious part that we recognize. It's kind of a spiritual flow. Being in the presence of someone talking, you can feel it acutely when she was in this state of possession. She could feel more intuitively, I guess, the spiritual dynamics of just being around someone, you know, in that presence of relationality. Um, so I thought it was an interesting example of how most people think of possessions as someone's playing with a Ouija board or doing all kinds of traditional demonic stuff. But this one came in through intellectual uh, appeal. And have you seen this before in other cases? Absolutely. I mean, David, think of the world in which we live today. We are permeated by technology that gives us knowledge at our fingertips. We want to know something. We just you know, Google it right away and, and there's the answer. So it does seem to be that, you know, as humanity is advancing in technology and knowledge, that somehow we've convinced ourselves that we don't need God because we have all the answers ourselves. And the devil would love nothing more than for us to accept that as the truth. Another case is a, 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 a gentleman who was a priest and he was getting interested into a popular theory at the time by, I think, Tellyard, where which is this idea that Jesus is the full completion of evolution. You know, he's the fullest point, the omega point of nature. And the demon started working with him on that intellectual idea, saying while he was performing the Mass, he said it felt like there was a remote control in the back of his head getting him to change the words and mumble wicked stuff in replace of the sacred words. And... Uh, again, this is something that came in through an intellectual concept of saying, you know, Jesus is not really, you know, you know, son of God. He's the fullness of nature. He's the fulcrum of all of evolution, getting us to worship nature and nature, the, you know, the divinity of nature. And that subtle thing eventually caught that priest in possession. And another priest in the story who's trying to get this exorcism performed made a fatal mistake, according to Father Malachi Martin. He says something to the point when the demon is uh, wrestling in that situation, something to the effect of, you know, we can inflict suffering, and the priest said, I will endure. And when he did that, he made a fatal mistake of taking it away from Christ and saying, I can do it. And that priest then started being almost possessed for many, many weeks as well uh, from that same host of spirits. Have you encountered examples of folks I guess there's a lot of things there, again, appealing to kind of a twisted doctrine to get possession. And then number two, the fact that a priest could be possessed sounds completely foreign to most people's concept of this. I think people should understand that in an exorcism, Jesus is the main actor. He's not a bystander. And whenever a priest in an exorcism tries to become the main actor in that story that you just shared from Malachi Martin, that's when he can make himself susceptible to demonic attacks and even possession itself. Because in an exorcism, it's never what the priest is doing. It's always on the power and the authority of Jesus Christ at work in and through his ministers and in and through the church. But whenever a priest attempts to do things on his own, that's when he gets himself in trouble. You know, I, st I studied and trained as an exorcist in Rome back in 2006. So I had the opportunity to spend three months in Rome and to work with a seasoned exorcist. And after is the three Father months- Father Amorth, Amorth, or is it, isn't it Gabriel? I met Father Gabriel Amorth. Uh, the priest I trained with was a Franciscan named Father Carmine de Philippus. Okay. Both Father Carmine and Father Gabriel Amorth were trained by a passionist priest, Father Candido Amentini. He did exorcisms at the Church of the Holy Stairs in the city of Rome just across the street from St. John Lateran Basilica. But Father Carmine warned me after my three months in Rome. He said, if you're ever doing an exorcism and you say to yourself, wow, look at what I'm doing, he said, you've just walked on unholy ground. He said, because you've now 
place the focus on yourself mm -hmm. and not on Christ. And I think in that situation, the story you just shared, because that priest shifted the focus away from Christ and onto himself, that's where he got himself into trouble. I always tell people that if they're relying on me as an individual, uh, if they're possessed, then we're all in trouble. But if we're relying on the power and the authority of Christ, yeah. that's the proper mindset to have. I mean, that's the thing that was striking to me about the because I haven't seen, you know, when I, I've looked at, you know, interviews of your, you and uh, other uh, contemporary exorcists, and I haven't seen reports of, of the priest being afflicted very much. But that was what was shocking when I listened to this Hostage to the Devil book by uh, Martin was that there's these examples, and he probably picked them out to show the extreme cases, but, you know, of priests having physical afflictions of, of feeling claw marks scratching into their internal organs while they're doing exorcism. Uh, one priest passes away at 45 or 47 years old of some kind of heart failure that just happened after the exorcism was completed. And, uh, you know, these, and, and he, I think he alludes that some of these afflictions are because of mistakes that the priests make in the right. And so I don't know, maybe that's why they inflict, they have these types of horrible stories where their things kind of get botched. They barely make it out with their life. You know, is that what it's all about when, I mean, have you heard of people who, you know, made a fatal mistake and had physical affliction because of an exorcism they didn't perform in the true spirit of Christ? Definitely. Many okay. examples of that, because again, there's no such thing as an emergency exorcism. Mm -hmm. When the priest does not follow the proper procedures and protocols of the church, that's where he quickly gets himself in trouble. Because when a priest is too quick to jump into an exorcism, that's where the devil may have the upper hand. Mm -hmm. But again, a priest should always be very you know, deliberate in uh, helping those who are afflicted. And again, every exorcism prayer will provide somebody with some level of benefit and help even if at that moment it doesn't expel the demon completely. So again, we should never rush into anything, but should always be very deliberate in our actions, making sure that the focus is always on the person of Jesus Christ. So that, that raises the point I've heard people say, why is it if, this is, if the demons are going to have total submission to the name of Christ, why isn't it something that when you perform the right, it's one thing, and you say it by the power of Christ, you know, you're you're gone, be gone. Why is why don't they listen on the first time if Christ has that authority? And the answer seems to be that there's a difference between exorcisms in the apostate world and what one may call the pagan world. So the apostate world, think of the fact that the Western world has been shaped and built by Christianity. But there are many people in the Western world who have rejected their Christian roots. So people who knew the truth of Jesus Christ by growing up in these traditional Christian homes and who've now rejected the faith, it does seem that demons have greater control on them because, again, they knew the truth and then walked away from it, as opposed to maybe other parts of the world where the good news of Jesus Christ has not been fully proclaimed, people there who are possessed when exorcisms are performed, they are literally one and done. Wow. But I think the difference is in the apostate world. So is it a matter of the reason why you have to, you don't just say one command and that's over, is it because with every exorcism, there is the free will choice of the person being victimized by the spirit that has to fully accept and believe and truly reject it as well, right? You can't just just uh, you know, uh, you know, do do it with without the person uh, consenting to say I agree with following Christ and rejecting this spirit. You have to have that free will choice component for the exorcism to be completed, and the level of faith. Faith mm -hmm. is such a key ingredient. The person really has to believe. Mm -hmm. You know, when Jesus returned to his hometown of Nazareth. It says in the Bible that he wasn't able to do much there except for curing a few people who were sick, so much did their lack of faith discourage him. So we really have to have that level of faith. And it does seem to me that there's a growing trend today for a lot of people who believe they are afflicted by the devil to treat the exorcist as a magician, meaning they believe that I have powers or I have a special bag of tricks that I can use to make 
your problems go away, but they really want nothing to do with God. So it's almost... Would, yeah, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, you I was going to say, I, I would even suggest that casting the demon out is, is the easy part. The harder part is getting the person to invite God in. You know, in, in chapter 11 of Luke's gospel, it talks about once the demon has been cast out, it goes and wanders through the arid wasteland, and then coming back and finding the house swept clean, meaning it's gone, but God has not been invited in. Then the demon goes and finds seven other demons worse than itself, and they come back and take up residence in the person. So again, the person really has to have that level of faith for that demon to really be cast out. But if a person doesn't really want to change their life, they don't want to commit their life to the Lord or recommit their life to the Lord, then the demons will still lay some claim on these people. And that's why it takes more than one command by the power of Christ, because ultimately Christ does have dominion over those spirits, but it's but when it's afflicting a particular person, that person has to consent and have trust that Christ will deliver them and fully commit to Christ for that completion to have happen, right? Yes. Yes. So, so that so that would seem to suggest that almost like those tribalistic cultures or paganistic cultures that are more in tune with the spirit world, they almost have like a more childlike trust. Like faith mean pistis means trust. So they have more mm-hmm. of a faith. They have more of a childlike trust in the reality of the spirit world. Period. And then when you come in with the power of God over that spirit, they're more childlike and trusting. Yes, this truly is real. I don't have any skeptical resistance to this. Right. Yeah, it's that it's that level of faith. You know, there's a an exorcism account in Mark's gospel where uh Jesus' disciples are trying to cast a demon out of a boy, but they weren't able to do it. And Jesus says this kind can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. And so the father says to Jesus, Well, help him if you can. And the boy is convulsing on the ground, and Jesus looks at the father and says, If and the father makes a great line and he says, Lord, I do believe, help my unbelief. In other words, I have faith, but it needs to be taken to a higher level. And oftentimes people who are possessed, they may have some level of faith, but it needs to be taken to that higher level. And when it reaches that higher level is when the demons truly will be cast out. Uh, So do you believe that God permits these possessions as a means of grace to pull both the victim of possession and those who hear about the story to follow Christ? Absolutely. I think it's a form of evangelization. Remember what I said earlier, the demons were cast out of heaven, but they weren't cast out of creation. God still uses them for his purposes. So God can use the activity of demons to uh, bring people closer to him. Now, demons always believe that what they're doing is advancing their kingdom, but ultimately all demonic activity always advances the kingdom of God. You know, when Jesus is is dying on the cross, the devil believes that it's his moment of victory. But his moment of victory that he perceives is actually his moment of defeat. Because then the devil realizes that everything that he was doing to push Jesus towards the crucifixion was actually playing into God's hands. That's very interesting. What, what, what do you make of when Jesus tells his disciples, when they say, Lord, shall we, because they've been evangelizing and they get rejected by some people, you know, in the village, and they say, Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven like a, like the prophet? And he says, you, you don't know what spirit you're speaking of. Was he, was he saying that they were of an evil spirit, or was he just talking about something different there when he talks about that? That's James and John, when Jesus and yeah. his disciples are headed to Jerusalem and they have to pass through Samaritan territory, but the people wouldn't welcome them because their destination was Jerusalem. And then James and John say, Lord, would you have us call down fire from heaven to destroy them? And Jesus rebukes them for that attitude because, again, that's death and destruction. That speaks of non-existence. Yeah. You know, that's demonic, if you will. Yeah. And it certainly goes against everything that Jesus was trying to teach them. Is that why he also tells Peter, get behind me, Satan, when he says, don't go to the cross? Because Peter's thinking at that time, let's have a revolution. You know, you've got the crowds growing. You've got a movement here. Let's not just, you know, let's be, let's let let's let you be on the throne. Let's let you be a king, you know, in a messianic warrior spirit. Is it that same spirit there that the, 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 when he calls him an accuser, you, you get behind me, accuser, Satan? Yes, I think so, because again— you know, 
what does Jesus basically say to Peter is you're thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. Mm -hmm. And again, that's what the devil is always trying to get us to do, to ignore the voice of God and to listen to our own voices. And certainly the devil is always ready to whisper in our ear, if you will, to try to get us to believe that his lies will lead us to ultimate happiness in this life. What, do you, what did Jesus mean when he said, how can Satan cast out Satan? You know, they, they were accusing him of casting out spirits by evil spirits. Was that a, a common accusation that was leveled against people who were doing exorcisms at the time? Or was that, you know, what was the thought process behind them accusing him of that? And what did he mean when he gave him that, that answer? I think Jesus is telling us that we cannot use the forces of evil to defeat the, the devil. So if the devil really is evil personified, you cannot use evil to combat evil. That's like in a, in a modern sense, think of the number of people who may turn to magic and witchcraft, to so-called witches and warlocks and sorcerers, thinking that they can turn to these people and receive some good benefit. And the church would condemn all of these things because the forces behind all of that are the forces of evil. And again, you cannot use evil to fight evil. And I think that's what Jesus was trying to point out. So when I see that, I, I wanted to, you know, I've heard that the teaching is that the demons are super intelligent, more intelligent than humans. How come they don't have the intelligence to realize if we're doing these demonic possessions, it's going to be a means of self, you know, of, of salvific grace for folks who are going to hear about this and say, wow, I thought the science had ruled out any of this stuff being a reality. And there I hear uh, a priest such as yourself saying, uh, I saw someone levitate. My God, there's really a spiritual world. I want to be following Christ. How come they haven't figured that out yet? Or maybe they did. And that's why they don't do it as much in the, in the West. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's a sense of arrogance. Yeah. You know, when demons possess people, they really do not want to manifest. The devil would prefer to work in the shadows and on the sidelines. But we can say that at an exorcism, demons are forced into the light of Christ. You know, you think of a house that's infested by bugs. When you go in and turn on the light, what do the bugs do? They crawl for every crack and crevice to get into them. So in an exorcism, the, the church is throwing the light of Christ on somebody who is afflicted. And it forces the demons to show themselves. You know, demons are so arrogant that the reason they manifest during an exorcism, they reach the point where they cannot stand the fact that they are being commanded to do something by a creature that they consider to be inferior than themselves. You know, an exorcist told me that he was doing an exorcism one time, and when the demon manifested, it shouted out, who are you to tell me what to do, you stupid, crazy monkey? So again, it's that sense of arrogance that they believe that they are so much greater than we are that forces them to manifest. But ultimately, they don't really want to do that. But everything that the church does in an exorcism, from blessing the person with holy water to reading some scripture, the laying on of hands, all of these things infuriate demons to the point that they have to manifest. And when they manifest, that's when the battle against them truly begins. When they, well, if they think of us as so lowly, why do they take? Why do they care about possessing us? Just to, or humans? Why would they want to do that if we're such a low, uh, little stinky animal to them? <laughs> the answer is at the very core of our Christian identity. So, what's the greatest thing that God has done for us? It's the incarnation. God took on human form, and because the devil wishes to mimic God in every possible way. The devil, in his own twisted sense, believes that he takes on human form when he possesses a human body. But then what does the demon do with that human body? He distorts it, causes it to act animalistic in nature. And the devil does that as a way of mocking the human person created in the image and likeness of God, because the devil believes that by attacking the human person and degrading the human person, that he's indirectly attacking God himself. So he's so he's he wants to see God, God the Father have sorrow and, and and pain, seeing his children afflicted, and that's what he's doing it for. You Again, know, it's, it's, the it's, father it's grieves when a sparrow falls, right? So yeah. if he sees, you know, he's just trying to hurt God's feelings or something. What I mean, what's the 
What's he's, the... mo- he's, he's mocking God. Yeah. But again, always remember that God is permitting this to happen. Demons cannot do anything that God does not permit. If demons had free reign, the world in which we live would be a lot more chaotic than it already is. So demons are permitted by God to do certain things. But again, God only permits them to do certain things that ultimately, in the end, will always advance the kingdom of God. Um, do they know that when they're possessing someone? Like, oh, let's have some fun, but we know this is going to be used to mess up our plans anyway. So let's have some fun while we can here. Is that how it is? Or I mean, do they Absolutely. are they aware yeah, of that? They, they are aware of that because they know that in past possessions, that's exactly the end result. They're aware of that, but again, in their arrogance, they keep trying again and again and again. Um, so when you see uh, these different examples of, of possessions, again, it, it, I, when, when I think of, okay, evil, why would you afflict? You know, I hear about stories of, and again, I'm looking at some of these case studies of people. There's one gentleman in the Hostage to the Devil book who's just seemed to live such a miserable life. His mother... His father gets into destitute poverty and dies at a young age. His mother picks up prostitution. They were holy at one point, a righteous family, and they just fell apart. He's on his own at a young age. And I'm thinking to myself, this is a guy who's, you know, why do you, why, why would, first of all, why would God, this is kind of a theodicy question, why would God permit a poor person like that who's had such a miserable childhood and horrible pains and suffering of a little boy seeing his mother broken from such an evil profession. And then it's like adding insult to injury. You put demons, you know, allow them to have demons in. I mean, where's the grace there? Where's the mercy to, why would God allow that? And then I hear stories like the story that preceded Malachi Martin's death, where he says that the last exorcism that he was trying to perform was on a little girl, you know, and it didn't seem like he was able to complete it before he had some kind of bizarre fall that he attributes to a spirit knocking the stool, knocking him off of a stool in his study when he's trying to get a book and he dies. And this little girl is possessed at four years old or something. Why would God in his loving mercy allow things to happen to people who don't have any consent? They're not doing occultic behavior. They're not living horrible. They're just a child. Yeah, and I, that's why we always have to look at all those stories and to realize, you know, that's Malachi Martin's perspective on that. You know, any mm-hmm. child under the age of reason, which according to the Catholic Church is the age of seven, cannot bring evil upon themselves. Mm-hmm. God would always protect and safeguard them. So for a child under the age of reason to be afflicted by evil, then one who has some authority over the child bears responsibility for that, such as a parent or a guardian. And then it's also important to make the distinction between what does God desire and what does God permit? You know, just because God permits something doesn't mean that's exactly what God desires. But ultimately, I think you're trying to ask the question, how do we know the mind of God? And the answer to that is we cannot know that. You know, St. Augustine always said that when you're studying theology and at the moment you say to yourself, I now understand God. He said that what you have understood is not God, because the human person is incapable of truly comprehending the majesty of God. It, we just yeah. cannot, do it because a creature cannot be on the same level with the creator. Yeah. So ultimately, we just have to commend anyone who's afflicted to the mercy and care of God and believe that somehow everything that's happening is uh, God is using it to advance his kingdom. Yeah. When you see the history of wars, you see the lies that are lo- that lead us into wars. In my work, I've been able to study some of the false flags even that governments have done to their own people to to create a reason to have a war that wasn't necessary and the bloodshed and the and the carnage. You know, I, I look at in Vietnam 55 years later after we were there, people are still having cancers and mutations on their children being born because of something that was done to them and people, veterans here, still afflicted by uh, diseases. I look at Iraq. I look at the the lies that were diabolical lies that brought us into a conflict where hundreds of thousands of Iraqis are dead and they are afflicted with cancers because of chemicals. You look at all that stuff and it just seems like pure evil. Are those examples in which the decision makers that are ruling the world are possessed? Because it's like, 
what else would explain that when it's just layers of lies on lies on lies just for destruction, chaos, and death? Well, I don't know if it, they're possessed, but their egos may be inflated. You know, mm. the sin of Lucifer was the sin of pride. Mm. You know, the focus was on self. When people are trying to create a name for themselves and by conquering and death and destruction, there's a lot of collateral damage. You know, the devil may not be behind all the troubles that we see in our world, but the devil is an opportunist. So he can take advantage of any situation you know, whether it's the wars that we see going on today, all the death and destruction. People have asked me oftentimes, you know, is COVID-19, you know, was the devil behind that? And again, who knows? But ultimately, the devil can take advantage of any situation as a way to try to attack the human race. You look at COVID-19, what's one of the consequences of that? We went into isolation. And then in isolation, a lot of people became attached to their screens on their gadgets and whatnot. And then that opened them up to a lot of the world of addiction and whatnot. So the devil can take advantage of certain situations that may be brought about by our own personal choices for evil as a way to advance his agenda. So when you, so when you look at these different examples of these events that people are experiencing in possession, is that a sign that when you look at uh, uh, folks going through those things that demonic activity is surging in recent times, or it's just always about the same level of activity? We just have more ways of reporting on it now because of internet and everything like that, cameras. and. I think it's surging. Again, that's yeah. because God is being ignored in our yeah. society. When I was appointed back in 2005, as the exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, I became one of only 12 stably appointed exorcists in the United States. There is now an exorcist training school in the United States for Catholic priests, and they now have more than 300 graduates. So if you think about it, from 2005 until now 2023, we went from having 12 to now 300 exorcist priests in the United States just within the Catholic tradition. And again, there are exorcists within other faith traditions. So it's a reality that Christian churches recognize that demonic activity is on the rise because a lot of people, again, who used to identify as Christian no longer do so. Now, even for people today who tell me that they're an atheist, I always like to remind them that the devil is not an atheist. The devil knows that God exists, but he wants to, us to be convinced that the devil or that God does not exist. That's what the devil wants, to convince us that God does not exist. That way we can become masters of our own destiny. We can make any choices that we want and somehow believe that they are good. You know, in this life, we can act independently from God, but when we die, ultimately, we all stand before the Lord in judgment. So in the afterlife, we can no longer act independently from God, and we will be held accountable for how we chose to live in this world. So really, to me, the ministry of exorcism is all about evangelization. If there's a lot of people today who are spiritually asleep, the ministry of exorcism is a way of ringing a bell, if you will, and telling people, it's time to wake up and to give God his rightful place in their life. It seems like it can it can help a lot of doubting Thomases who have lo- who've become cynical about everything. Um, do, you, do you mention other faith traditions? Are you aware? Uh, is it possible for people in different religions outside of the Trinitarian Christian faith to perform exorcisms in other religions, or or is that possible? I think there there may that may be possible. There's elements of that because ultimately it's what God is doing. And if God were to choose to act within another faith tradition, then again, it's what God is doing. Yeah. And I certainly would not want to be the one that is going to put limits on yeah. what God is capable of doing. But as Christians, we would say that the truth of the faith is really within our Christian faith. But elements of that truth can be found perhaps within other 
um, faith well, traditions. What confuses me about that is I've heard that that's possible, but then I think to myself, well, we 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 identify religions, um, uh, pagan religions, as being doctrines of devils, and then so how do you you know if if you're operating from a religion that is false, even though there might be truth in it, uh, it seems like a perfect condition by which. Satan could have his playground because if he's only obeying the power of Christ and you're invoking some other deity or some other God here or there, it sounds like you're lost in a house of mirrors. I don't understand how you could possibly perform a, a successful exorcism apart from, you know, God breaking through your errors, both the person performing the exorcism or whatever they call it in other religions and the folks who are believing in false doctrines. If those are doctrines of demons, it feels like there's hopelessness there, but I'm sure, like you said, God can work through anything, right? Yeah, and I think what you just said may be true, that God can break through maybe that error and then mm. in the exorcism help the person come to an awareness of the truth. You know, in, in the Old Testament, when King Saul goes to the witch of Endor to conjure up the spirit of Samuel, and the spirit of Samuel is conjured up, even the witch of Endor is shocked by what she sees. But again, it wasn't that she conjured up Samuel's spirit, it's what God permitted. Mm -hmm. And then God may have done that as a way to lead somebody who was in error to the truth. Yeah. So when when you see these examples of uh, the things that they do to the human body, you I think you, in another interview you mentioned seeing an example of, of writing on someone's skin and blood appearing in front of you and then going away, uh, head going 360. How is that possible? Is that some kind of spiritual illusion that's not really, it's not physically bones moving up 360 on the neck. I mean, that would break the neck, wouldn't it? I mean, is it a spiritual deception that the demon is putting in people's eyes? Is it a parlor trick? What's go Is it physically bones moving that way? Well, I think we have, I think it can be a combination of both. The demonic can play on a person's memory and imagination. Mm -hmm. It causes us to see things that may not be there. But again, whenever somebody is possessed, we have to realize that it's no longer that person as an individual. It's now the demon acting through that person. And demons transcend time and space as we understand it. We can even say that demons as purely uh, spiritual creatures are disembodied intellects. But then when they possess a person, then they're twisting and tormenting that body. And because of that, it's not... You know, it's kind of like taking it into a different realm. You know, in possession, it isn't necessarily true that the demon is inside of the person. It means that the demon is containing the person. St. Thomas Aquinas would say that pure spirits are not contained by space. They contain the space. So if we're in a room, the room is containing us. But for a spirit, it's containing the room. So when one is possessed, the demon is containing that body and kind of putting it in a different realm, if you will. And because of that, the demon would be capable of doing all these things that we would call extraordinary, you know, head spinning and, and you know, bodily contortions that would just seem impossible for the human body. Yeah. But again, we yeah. have to remember now the demon is containing that body and putting it within that different realm. So these things are possible. And again, I go back to... <laughs> You know, if people are creating wars and lies and killing millions of people, wouldn't that be what Satan's focus would be in terms of doing that? Why would he spend the time, you know, making someone's head go 360 that four people are seeing when he could be spending his time inciting another war to kill a million people? It just seems like more more bang for your wicked buck if you wanted to create evil in the world. Why would you spend your time doing parlor tricks in front of you and four other people? I'm just thinking from a skeptical perspective trying to understand this i mean I, that people might think that are skeptical of all of this to say wait a second this is evil what's the taxonomy of evil here i mean if someone's you know saying words in another tongue i mean how how much evil does that do in the world versus you know plotting lies and creating a million deaths and broken families for generations that's that's much more of a Diabolical. I think the devil loves the devil loves collateral damage. So the wars and all of those things you mentioned, the devil loves all those things. But in an exorcism, why in front of only four or five people? Collateral damage. You know, if the demon can terrify these people to the extent, including the priest, the priest, you know, impacts the lives of 
countless numbers of individuals through his ministry. If the demon can get the priest to abandon his vocation, then there will be collateral damage to that. If other people are present and they they see that and then they are so afraid that they abandon their faith and say it's the father, then his uh, family will no longer grow up in the church. His children probably will not be baptized. They will never be married in the church. They will have no connection with faith whatsoever. So I think the devil always looks at things in terms of collateral damage and long term. Well, so even though there may be four people in the room, if those four people can be convinced to abandon their faith, that will impact the lives of countless individuals. And there are examples of angelic uh, beings uh, intercepting and stopping a, a possession while you're in the room. I mean, is that what you see happening where an angelic being can, can, you know, you know, I think in, in the Catholic possession? tradition, in the Catholic tradition, a part of the uh, exorcism, right? after blessing the person with holy water, reminding ourselves of our new life in Christ, you know, it reminds us of Paul's letter to the Romans. Are you not aware that we who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So again, it's that notion that we have put on Christ. Then there is the litany of the saints invoking the angelic creatures, the blessed mother, the, the saints of the church, and calling them to be present in this particular prayer of the church. So yeah, whether they are good angelic creatures, the holy men and women that we now believe are in heaven, they're called to participate in the exorcism of the church. I remember in Father Martin's book, he talks about an example of a familiar spirit, which is like a lesser spirit that uh, comes as a little companion, almost like a demonic Jiminy Cricket or something that gives insight mm -hmm. to the person who's being afflicted and doesn't des directly possess at first but just kind of provide special facts. Stay away from that person. You know, don't do that. You know, kind of like a little sidekick. And then at some point there's an opportunity where they say, let me in. And then there, he's basic that, that little lesser spirit, this little familiar spirit is working for a more powerful spirit. Have you encountered that kind of dynamic? Absolutely. You know, when somebody is possessed, rarely is it a case of one demon. It's usually multiple demons. Mm -hmm. And there's always the demon of a higher rank. You know, when the angels fell from the nine choirs of angels, they fell from all nine ranks. So just as much as there is a hierarchy in the angelic world, there is a hierarchy in the demonic world. And it may be some of these familiar spirits that you talk about that may be trying to get a foothold into the person's life. And usually that's how the demonic activity begins. It's something very subtle. Maybe people think that it's fun or entertaining. You know, you mentioned earlier things like Ouija board and whatnot. You know, I think a lot of those things are entry level things, if you will, into the world of the demonic. You know, the devil's trying to see if he can get people's attention. And then once he has their attention, to pull them deeper into the world of darkness. You know, even in the gospel accounts, when demons speak to Jesus, it's always interesting that they go from speaking in the singular to the plural. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Have you come against us before the appointed time? And to me, that gives the indication that there are multiple uh, demons that are present when somebody is possessed. Yeah, there's a there seems to be a hive mind, crowd spirit dynamic to demonic behavior, mm -hmm. which would seem to say, like Soren Kierkegaard said, the crowd is a lie. And I think crowd spirits, you know, whether you look at what happens in uh, different recent protests, the BLM, where there's cities aflame and crowds are whipped up into an angry mob, or January 6th, where people get whipped up into an angry mob. There's a, there's something diabolical sometimes that takes place in a crowd where people have good intentions, and then it just takes one or two people or something to start triggering a cascade of domino negativity, right, that kind of builds yeah. up. And people feel you, like they're you, possessed by the spirit of the crowd, you know? You think of, you know, we're getting ready to enter into Holy Week. You know, it begins on Palm Sunday, you know, the crowds are welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem and, you know, laying palms and waving them. But then just a few days later, this, these are the same people that become the crowd that start yelling, crucify him. Kind of that mob mentality takes over that you were just speaking of and then calling for his death. So one minute they're glorifying him, the next minute they're calling for his death. So there is that mob mentality that can take over 
can influence a lot of people. You know, what's, what's interesting about our time, because I've heard a lot of folks in, in telling me, and, and I have felt the same way, there's a deep feeling in our culture right now of despair and cynicism. There's a feeling like America's best days are long behind us, and we're going to go into a lot of conflict and violence and, 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 and things that we have not been accustomed to living in a relatively comfortable, you know, world power culture. Uh, that other cultures are more familiar with. Um, and so I guess what I'm asking is, how should we prepare spiritually for this? And how should we feel and think about these times? Because I just had some the other day tell me, I've just never felt the deep feeling of foreboding and despair about the state of this country. I don't know where to go. People don't know where to buy a home they, or, or, or to, to, you know, to, to flee the, to be nimble, to flee the country if things are going to collapse. You see every day on YouTube and Twitter videos of 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 uh, uh, students beating their teachers, just wailing at them, punching and kicking, and ter- it, it's pretty terrifying. And and I think in an ironic way, people are seeking folks like you out for a sense of comfort to remind them that okay, this isn't God hasn't abandoned us, because that's the worst feeling is like that feeling of there is no spiritual dimension here. It's just man you know, accidentally evolving from blobs. And here we are just turning into melee. That's a very bleak nihilistic feeling to feel right. And people want to, yeah, there's almost a comfort when you say, I saw someone levitate that almost gives people comfort. Cause they're like, Oh wow. So there is something more than this, you know, <laughs> that we can have hope in. Right. There and is it, something, there is something more. And the thing that always gives me hope and confidence in the midst of all this bleakness that we see in the world today is to always remember that God is in charge, and in the end, God wins. So we already know the end of the story. The question is, whose side will we choose to be on? So when we look at the world in which we live, and it seems to be crumbling and falling apart, that should be a wake-up call to turn to God and to give God his rightful place in our lives once again. And if we can do that, and we know that God is the solid foundation, there really is nothing to fear. So on a collective action, should Christians take a posture of we should fight and politically put our Christian values back in? Or, I mean, not that these are, I'm not asking for a political prescription, but these are spiritual matters. How should we live? Should we just be nonviolent and suffering servants and take on the afflictions of this world as they're going to try to, you know, basically uh, pulverize people who stand firm to Christian values and just be the embrace a martyr spirit or should we take a defensive posture of saying no let us protect what we still have and assert force to in terms of political force i'm saying uh to to protect our rights and things like that or you know is or is that a, a fool's game we should just surrender to the cross of this moment it may be a combination of both you know when peter says to jesus lord we've given up everything to follow you what can we expect in return And the very last thing that Jesus promises is persecution. So to me, when the church is being persecuted, it's a sign that she's being authentic to the mission of Jesus. When the church becomes too comfortable and isn't being persecuted, then perhaps we're not really doing our job. So to me, persecution is a sign of fidelity to God. And again, we always have to live from an eternal perspective. You know, the world in which we live is, you know, just a, a, a split second, if you will, compared to eternity. So we should always, again, be in this world, but not of the world, to always live from that eternal perspective and to recognize that God has something more in store for us than this life that we now know. You know, if, if this life is it and then the, the end of the story, no wonder so many people live the way that they do. They're trying to you know, grab anything and everything that they can, and whoever gets stepped on and killed along the way doesn't matter. But again, if we're living from an eternal perspective, then we recognize that each and every person has been created in the image and likeness of God. They are brothers and sisters, and we should treat them with a certain amount of love and respect and present them the truth. You know, if you truly love somebody, you don't tell people what they want to hear, you tell them what they need to hear. You know, think of parents, you know, the child's going to put their finger in the socket. No, 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 don't do that. Or don't touch the hot stove. So again, 
limitations and rules aren't bad. And if we truly love people, we have to present them with the truth. But we also have to accept the fact that some people may not want to hear the truth, and the end result is Christians persecuted. As an exorcist, would you recommend parents stay away from, or keep their kids away from TV and TikTok and these things, or just monitor them? You know, some people are, are pretty strong. Get those things out if you have the willpower to do it. And some people say, no, 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 that's that's too far. You can embrace them in a moderate way or something. It may be too hard now because these things are out there. The children have already been exposed to them. So children, you know, parents today may need to help educate their children on how these things that they're seeing or doing or watching are inconsistent with our Christian faith. You know, certain types of literature that children read, books that get them fascinated with magic. Parents always say, you know, are they good? Are they bad? And my response is, which do your children know better? The books of the Bible or the books on magic and casting spells? And if they know more about the world of magic than about the books of the Bible, there's the problem. But if children knew the Bible well enough and could filter all of this occult stuff and new age stuff through our Christian faith, then perhaps it could be used as a teachable moment. Now, there's been an uptick in interest in the possibility of UFOs and aliens. Uh, some you know, people have reported being abducted by aliens for years, but now with the government kind of normalizing it as, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we don't know what these things are. These are not our vehicles. We don't know anything about these little strange objects floating in the sky. Uh, there's been an uptake in interest that there's going to be some kind of disclosure, whether it be a fake hoax to get people to go along with some new government program or whatever. Or if it's a real thing, uh, you know, would that what what's the Catholic teaching or do they have a position? Is there a position of the church that says, OK, uh, if these things show up, those are demons? <laughs> or do we say, well, it could be another creature that God created in another galaxy? And what would be the test to know what they are? You know, I don't know that the church has any official stance on that. You know, in our creed as Catholics that we recite at Mass on Sunday, we say that God is the creator of all things visible and invisible. And again, it doesn't matter where they are in God's creation. God had to create them. There are some people that speculate that maybe all these sightings that you mentioned are demonic entities, but the church doesn't really have any official position on that right now. Uh, you know, a lot of folks, folks say, well, some of these things are ruled out as mental disorders. Is it fair to say, uh, demonic possessions I'm talking about now, is it fair to say, though, that even if they are someone is mentally afflicted with a disorder like schizophrenia, that that is itself a work of the devil that's afflicting people with mental illnesses, even though yeah, it's not I, possession? Yeah, it's not possession, but one can see, again, that maybe it's a form of some demonic activity because, again, the human person is being deprived, if you will, of wholeness and completeness, and certainly... Again, it goes back to our initial discussion that the devil is always about distorting the human person, about non-existence, afflicting the human person, if you will. So, you know, in the world of exorcism, the church always wants to make a distinction between whether or not somebody is possessed or whether they're suffering from a mental illness. Because even some of the same symptoms that we see in people who are possessed can also be seen in people who are suffering a mental health issue such as schizophrenia, Tourette's syndrome, people can have a, a vocal outburst. You know, and again, so there can be a lot of these things. That's why you know, even people that are suffering from a mental illness deserve spiritual care. You know, they can be prayed with and you know, anointed, if you will, just to give them that notion that in their suffering, they're not alone. But the church always wants to make that clear distinction between is something demonic? Is it is it something physical? Is, is it something mental? So really looking at the person from the lens of, is it spiritual, physical, or mental? And then getting that person the true help that they need. But no matter what suffering people are going through, they deserve prayer to be commended to God, who can ultimately give people that sense of consolation that they're seeking. I, and I know that you make space for the role of psychiatry and psychology in this, but do you feel as if the modern 
uh, movement of therapeutic culture to elevate psychology and psychiatry as kind of dominant over the spiritual realm, right? To say that's our primary thing, and that spiritual thing with priests, they don't know what they've, they don't have proper psychology training. They don't have, and I know that the you know folks like yourself, you will, will consult with psychiatrists and so forth. But do you feel that that in itself is a trick of the devil to to position? this more modern field of knowledge like psychology and psychiatry as some kind of king above, oh, yeah, that spiritual thing. Yeah, I guess every now and then if that helps the person because they're spiritually minded, we'll, we'll consult a priest, but they don't know. They're, they're kind of a side relic. Do, do you see that as a, as a, as a deception, elevating it psychology? Be. It could be because there's a lot of people within the mental health profession that are uh, not religious, so they would be quick to discount the suffering that a person is going through that may be attributed to some spiritual entity. You know, they would say that, you know, we have the power to control this through medications and whatnot. But again, whenever I consult a psychiatrist, I'm not asking the psychiatrist, is this person possessed? I'm just asking the psychiatrist, is there something about this person that is outside of your level of training or your understanding? So is there something that you can't explain why this person is acting the way that they do? Maybe they're not responding to treatment or medications and whatnot. I myself will make that determination. But the church says I need to have moral certitude, meaning beyond a doubt the person in front of me is truly possessed. So I want to rely on the experts within the mental health field. The person is required to have a physical examination by their family doctor. But again, these experts are not giving their opinion on whether or not somebody is possessed, I will make that determination myself. And I will use some of the information they share with me to reach that conclusion of whether or not this is truly something demonic or not. Oh, Father Lampert, I, I don't want to take any more of your time. I know you're busy and I appreciate the time that, and, and insights that you've shared with us today. And you didn't come on to talk about your book, but I did want to point out that you have a book called Exorcism, The Battle Against Satan and His Demons, which is available online for uh, order if you want to learn more about uh, what you've done with this uh, field of knowledge. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it, David. I hope our conversation just challenges people to uh, think about the spiritual world and even more importantly, just to live out a godly life. Because if we're doing that, ultimately, evil is nothing to fear. Is the Eucharist our our, our primary means of defense? On a, our, or in terms of the tools of, of the church that we have? Absolutely. I think it's a very powerful one because, again, the Eucharist speaks of the incarnation. You know, Christ became one of us and Christ is still present with us. You know, so again, those are things very powerful. You know, again, thinking about the fact that as Christians, if we're living out our faith, you know, you're going to church. You're praying, reading the Bible, living out the sacramental life of the church, the Eucharist. Then again, the devil's already on the run. Well, thank you, Father Lampard. I appreciate your time. You're welcome, David. It's good to be with you.